why this precision is important. Uh, some of the, 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 the slower uh, couplings out there, if, we were, if we're calculating that this is our ideal torque uh, transfer you know, versus time, we want to follow that curve really precisely. And the reason we want to do that is because we don't want, again, we don't want those tires to break traction momentarily because if they do, not only does it break your, your confidence, but it, you lose grip and it's hard, harder to regain that grip. So if we're trying to follow this, this ideal torque curve with a coarser, uh, less controllable uh, torque transfer coupling, um, we're missing the target here most of the time. So this, this, is, this is a good, a good representation of what we're able to do with that uh, coupling. Um, <clears throat> another little tiny trick that we do to make this as precise as we need it to be is take out all the backlash in the rear drivetrain. So you've got the, the gear teeth, the splines that hold everything together uh, on the input and the output side. You've got the, the axles. All of those have a, a tiny bit of backlash in it. So you could take the drive shaft and rotate it a couple of degrees forward and back uh, with nothing happening. Um, if we're running along in full front wheel drive, no load on the drive shaft, when we go to transfer some torque to the rear, we don't know where in that backlash we're going to be. Sometimes it'll transfer torque immediately. Sometimes it'll have to move through that backlash. Um, and so to avoid that, even when we're running it basically full front wheel drive, we run one or two percent rear torque uh, just to load that up and keep it loaded up on the right side of that backlash so that it'll respond immediately when we need it. All right, now let's talk about um, how we got the efficiency of where we wanted it to be. Um, well, not where we want it to be. We'd like it to be as efficient as front-wheel drive or even better. Ultimately, we've got, these guys back here have ideas for, for how to actually make, one day make the all-wheel drive systems more efficient than two-wheel drive, but we're not there yet. Um, but what we've done so far is we've managed to get the, the fluid losses, the, the loss from pumping the oil around in the system down dramatically, get the weight impact down so the system's very, very lightweight. Um, and, and we're managing the torque split so precisely that actually there's a lot of conditions where, where we have better fuel economy with some rear drive than we would in just front drive. Um, this is, the, the, the efficiency of the system kind of varies depending on the conditions, but this is a good comparison test between the CX-7 system and the CX-5 system. Uh, the amount of energy loss, we dropped by 82% uh, at, at 60 kilometers per hour. So that's, that's a huge uh, improvement. Um, I'll just walk through some of the details. It's a whole lot of tiny details. It's kind of like you know the, the gram strategy when we're out trying to save weight. There's we, we take the same approach on, on energy efficiency as well. Um, <laughs> to minimize the, the fluid pumping losses, one thing we're doing is we've got the thinnest gear oil uh, of any oil drive system on the market. We've developed this uh, this unique fully synthetic gear oil that has a much more stable viscosity curve relative to temperature. So you see here, as the temperature goes up, all oils get get thinner. So your limiting factor of, of how thin you can make the oil is how it is will it be thick enough at its highest temperature. So you see we're we're not quite the thinnest at high temperature, but when it's cold, it is significantly thinner than, than all the other ones on the market. Um, most of the time, you drive the car, the the, the gearbox is cold, so that that uh, that really helps. Um, lowering the oil level will also lower the amount of. Uh, a, a pumping loss we have moving that oil around there. So we wanted to figure out how to get the oil level as low as possible. Um, again, tiny details. This is, a, this is a clear version of the differential case on a CX-3. And by running this clear case, we can see that we're trying to keep the oil here on the ring gear. And a lot of it is getting kicked off over uh, next to the diff where it doesn't really need to be. And because of that, we have to run more oil to keep the ring gear lubricated enough. And simply by casting a little rib into the inside of the, uh, of the cover, that keeps the oil where it needs to be unless it's running less of it. Um, this is a power takeoff over here, so we'll put the, at, the, uh, at the, the transmission where we take the, tor the power off and send it down the drive shaft. You can see this, this is the pinion shaft and the ring gear would go here. Uh, the, the, the pinion bearings are way up high, so we would have to run the oil level up here to keep those pinion bearings lubricated all the time. And that's a lot more oil than we actually need. Um, what we figured out is that the problem with those bearings is, you know, when you're running, oil gets kicked up to them and they stay lubricated. But when you park, everything drains off of them. So simply by putting a little rib here next to the bearing, so that when you park, there's a puddle of oil on that bearing, and as soon as you start going, it's lubricated immediately. That let us lower the oil level uh, and, and reduce some friction up there. <coughs> uh, in terms of weight, the the uh, Sort of the driving factor between how uh, driving factor for how, how heavy an all-wheel drive system needs to be is the vehicle weight times the tire radius. That determines the torque load on the system. 
So we mapped out um, our vehicle weight times tire radius and our oil drive system weight versus every system we've managed to get our hands on and, and measure. Uh, and we're, uh, we're the lightest for our size of anything we found, except for this mysterious gray thing that we didn't label. Um, I'm not going to read you the numbers, but in case you want to know how much lighter each one is, it's there and you've got it. Uh, this is, again, some of its little detail work. A lot of it is because we have um, really good control over the, the uh, over torque uh, loading on this uh, on the differential and the power takeoff. We know exactly what it's going to be, so we don't have to build a bunch of uh, overhead um, for, for some unforeseen circumstances. We know exactly how much torque we're putting into that thing. Uh, and our engineering tools now are, are, are really good um, at letting us really identify the, the, the detailed stresses on the gear teeth and taking out any stress concentrations that would weaken them. Uh, and once we've really optimized the gear tooth shape, we can then shrink the whole thing and still maintain the strength we need. So this differential, this is only, a, uh, I think it's 135 millimeter diff. It's absolutely tiny. This is the size of like a K car diff. This is in the back of the CX-5. Um, and that's how we're able to get the, the weight down so far. Um, so I mentioned uh, how we're managing the torque split to be the most efficient possible. The traditional thinking is that with an all-wheel drive, on-demand all-wheel drive system, front drive is always most efficient. You want to stay in front drive all the time. Uh, the reality is a little bit more complicated than that. Um, let me make, this is the same chart, just bigger. Um, we're looking at the, the percentage of rear torque split uh, versus uh, energy loss. And if you look at all the different things that contribute to that energy loss, this is the spin loss. This is the pumping of the oil that I was talking about. That's completely constant relative to torque split. It's, it doesn't matter how much torque you put through it, you're still churning the same amount of oil around. Um, the thing that you're usually trying to minimize is the friction loss. This is when you load up the gear teeth with some torque and those teeth are sliding across each other, the more torque you put across them, the more that, that loss increases. What most people don't consider is the, the losses at the tires themselves. Um, if you're overdriving the front tires and they're slipping against the pavement a little bit, you're, you're losing energy there, um, flexing and slipping that tire against the ground. So if we're, this is on a, a, a pretty slippery surface on snow, right? So on snow, our slip losses in the front are pretty high. And if we start sending torque to the rear, we reduce that slippage of the front tire and we start getting more efficient. But of course, we start slipping the rear tire and that starts coming up. So we add up all these different uh, losses and we get this, this sort of total uh, curve. And then you can see in that condition, uh, in the snow, it's more efficient if we run 40% rear torque split. So this is a condition where we're actually more efficient in all-wheel drive than we are in two-wheel drive. And this is why they've got this, this dream of being able to get to the point where even on dry pavement we can, we can reduce the tire losses enough to overcome the, the, the weight penalty and the drag of the all-wheel drive system. Um, <clears throat> if we look at um, on dry pavement, at this point it's still very close to 0% to rear torque is, is the most efficient on dry pavement. Uh, so that's why you know most of the time we're still running very little rear torque to the rear wheels unless you're in conditions like we're going to be all day today. Um, <coughs> so finally to the point of, of why we're here, uh, this system's been in our cars since the CX-5 uh, and the problem with it is that it works so well you have no idea that it's working. Uh, this is a completely invisible system, takes no input from the driver and because it, it, it intervenes before anything happens, you never know what's going on. Um, so. <coughs> These guys didn't even tell us how much they'd done when we launched the CX-5. We didn't even know how good the system was because we couldn't tell. Uh, so, um, what we're doing here, it's very hard for you guys to drive a car and evaluate one subsystem of the car. To drive a car and say, oh yeah, the all-wheel drive is really good. Because how, how do you know how slippery that surface was? How do you know how much of what you were feeling was, was the tire or the car uh, or whatever? So we can't, we can't eliminate the car as a variable. But the reason we brought everybody here is we can put you in different cars with different all-wheel drive systems on exactly the same tire, thank you Bridgestone, uh, and, and on exactly the same surface back to back to back. Because even every time you drive over the snow it changes the surface a little bit. So we'll just have you rotate through the same cars over the same surfaces enough times that you can really identify uh, what the differences are. There's a couple places on, on today's events where uh, the intelligence of our system is clearly blatantly obvious. Um, one, the most obvious one is we have a hill start where you drive up a hill, stop, turn the wheel, and try to pull away with a turned wheel. So this is kind of like pulling out of your steep driveway onto a road. Um, 
this is a condition where an on-demand all-wheel drive system is really conflicted about what to do. Because if you've got the wheel turned, uh, again, the rear wheels are going to go slower than the fronts, and you're going to bind up. Uh, and so an on-demand system, typically with the wheel turned, will decouple the rear wheels so that it doesn't bind up. Uh, but if you're on a snowy hill, of course, that means you're going to get stuck. You're at least going to slip and lose confidence for a second. Um, our system understands that it's on snow. It's figured out that it's on snow as it was driving up the hill. It knows it's freezing cold. It knows that, that it was having to feed a lot of torque to the rear wheels in order to keep the, the front tire slippage in its target zone. And so it knows when it's sitting up there, on, it also knows it's on a hill. It knows when it's sitting up there with the wheels turned that it's on snow and that it can lock up those rear, rear wheels without worrying about binding up. Um, we have a Subaru Forester out there that doesn't know that, and so to protect itself, it starts off in two-wheel drive and sl slips off the hill a little bit. Um, we've got a CRV that does start in four-wheel drive. Half the time it goes over the hill, half the time it doesn't. Um, the limiting factor on that particular car is their torque transfer coupling here isn't strong enough to handle all the torque of their engine. So if they've got too much torque demand, to the rear, it'll actually start spinning the front tires and start slipping that clutch. And then to protect the clutch, they disengage it so it doesn't slip and overheat. Um, this torque transfer coupling we've got here is capable of handling all of the torque of the engine. In fact, this same coupling is being used in the CX-9, so it can handle all of the torque of the CX-9. It's got no problem with the CX-5. Um, which brings me up to, a, to another point. Just to kind of help you understand all this talk about uh, torque split, there's a lot of sort of misunderstanding in, in this terminology. Everybody misuses it. We kind of misuse it sometimes. Um, all on-demand systems have the ability to lock the front and rear wheels together. Some people say this is a 50-50 torque split. It's a fair, reasonable thing to say. I've seen other companies with the exact same system say that, that they can do up to 70% of the torque to the rear wheels or up to 100% of the torque to the rear wheels. The reason they're all saying different things is that and the torque split, when you've got the front and rear wheels locked together, is not something that's directly controlled uh, by the, that clutch. It's, it's actually a result of the surface conditions. If you imagine the front and rear wheels are locked together, they have to turn the same speed, and the front tires are on ice and the rear tires are on dry pavement, which sounds unlikely, but pull out of the driveway of this hotel here where they have heated brick driveway <laughs> and your front tires are on ice, that's exactly what's happening there. Um, <coughs> In that condition, if you imagine all the drive shafts are made of rubber with a, with a stripe drawn down the side of them, right? What happens when you're turning everything to the same speed, the front tires are on ice and the rear tires are on bricks? Well, the front tires will turn pretty easily. They're not going to twist that rubber drive shaft very much. The rear tires are on bricks. They're going to resist a lot, and that drive shaft will twist up. That's your indication. That's your little mental model of, of how much torque is going where. So we could send 70, 80, 90, 100% of the torque to the rear wheels in that condition, depending on how little grip is in the front. If somehow we did a wheelie with a 1,000 horsepower CX-5, 100% of the torque would be going to the rear wheels. I don't think the torque coupling would handle 1,000 yeah, horsepower. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> You try to do the wheelie and we'll see. <laughs> so well, it, would be, it would be true to say in that condition, 70, 80, 90% of the torque is going to the rear wheels. That is not at all the same as saying it's a rear biased uh, system. It's not the same as, say, a, a, a GTR that has uh, an on-demand all-wheel drive system that starts with the rear drive and feeds the power to the front. Those can go 100% rear torque, but it's a completely different thing than this 100% rear torque we're going talking about here. So torque split itself is not enough to describe how a system works. That's all I'm getting at. Um, so that's just a little educational, the more you know, but uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's all I've got uh, for now. We'll do a little housekeeping.